Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode 11, The Trump Legacy. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. How are you doing today, Sam? Doing good. It's been a little bit of a while since we've done a podcast, but uh, looking forward to another great show. Yeah, yeah. We took a little time off over the holidays to redo the studio and so forth. Uh, in the process, we uh, have a new president. Um, so I thought it would be interesting. Uh, we had originally discussed... Um, doing a, a podcast on <clears throat> the insurrection on January 6th. And I thought that was probably, while it was a worthwhile topic, it might be a little too focused. I think it would be probably more interesting and more helpful to look at the Trump legacy in a more general sense. I don't want to, I'm trying, trying, trying to be as fair and impartial as possible. I don't want to just look at the negative stuff right. from Trump. And I, and I think the insurrection reflects very poorly on him. So today we're going to look at what some of his notable accomplishments were over the last four years. We'll look at some of, some of his failures. And then we'll have kind of an open discussion about what the lasting effects of Donald Trump on the U.S., the world, the presidency, and so forth are and then just a candid talk about where we think the future is uh, under Joe Biden for the next four years. So uh, ready to get into it? All right. So I wasn't even going to do the plugs because I think this is going to be a long podcast. We'll do the plugs at the end of the show. Um, so um, notable accomplishments. I kind of broke these down into a couple of key ones that that came out of the the whitehouse.gov website prior to the changeover and the first one and one that i think really is probably the biggest is the reshaping of the federal judiciary so everyone knows that trump appointed three supreme court justices that are life terms but he also appointed 220 judges to lower courts which are all lifetime appointments as well. 25% of U.S. Circuit Court judges were Trump that are in place today were Trump nominees. And Trump's influence as a result of that will live on through the judiciary for the foreseeable future. Um, do you think that is a, a good thing, a bad thing, an uh, indifferent thing? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think it depends on on what these judges are going to be ruling on in the coming years. Um, <clears throat> and especially since it's impressive as a president to be able to do that in only four years to um, appoint that many judges and three Supreme Court justices as well. Um, so whether or not they're going to – the judges will you know rule on certain things in the coming years, it's still um, – it's something that will be in a history book looking back at the presidency of, of one of his accomplishments. Absolutely. And and I think the one thing that we've seen so far is the three Supreme Court justices did not tip the balance of power in the Supreme Court at this point in time, given the number of cases that Trump brought to the Supreme Court during the election phase that did not go in his favor. Uh, so I think, uh, if nothing else, the impartiality of the Supreme Court seems to still be intact, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. Uh, the next thing that we, we look at is Space Force. 
Space Force is the first new branch of the U.S. military since the U.S. Air Force was created from the Army Air Corps uh, after World War II. It's supposed to be a more centralized version of the military missions in space. Now, that's not fighting aliens or anything like that. <clears throat> what they do is they handle satellite surveillance. They handle all the military satellites. that They're responsible for the GPS system that's both civilian and military use. Um, they're monitoring the various debris that's in space to make sure that it's not dangerous to future missions. What do you think? Do you think, like... I mean, I'll be honest with you. When I heard that we were creating Space Force, I couldn't help but chuckle. Mm -hmm. and, and I wasn't the only one because this, this spawned a Steve Carell comedy series yeah. you know, that came out of this. What are your thoughts on Space Force? Well, I think uh, space exploration is important. Um, and I know over the years, the public has sort of waned away from that. And there's not as much interest as there was like in the 80s and 90s and stuff. Um, I do think if Space Force is going to actually do something... <laughs> And it's not just a dumping ground for money like a lot of other of these types of programs. You know, they spend a lot of money, especially when it comes to the military. There's a lot of money put into that. Um, but I think if they do monitor things like the debris around the Earth, which is getting really like it's becoming a real problem um, and satellites and things like that, I think that's a good start. Um, and maybe they'll segue into actual exploration missions uh, in the future, hopefully. Yeah, we don't really know what direction they're going in right now. They really inherited a lot of things that the Air Force had already been doing. Um, they're not doing exploration at this point. Yeah. That is still the domain of NASA. But, you know, we have missions up there. You have an international space station up there that occasionally needs to be moved so it doesn't get hit by a refrigerator size piece of debris that brings it down. So yeah. that's really what they're working toward. And you also have private companies like... Um SpaceX that are going a lot more in, you know, they have a little bit more of a budget than NASA does for the funding. So they're able to do a lot more missions into space. Sure. Sure. Yeah. In fact, speaking of space junk, one of the things that's really starting to crowd the low earth orbit are these new, uh, internet enabled satellites, you know, SpaceX, Elon Musk is putting a huge constellation of satellites, some 400 or 500 satellites up there. Uh, all of which are moving obstacles that are flying at 17,500 miles an hour. So it's not a small job monitoring that stuff for safety. What's the next thing that we have? Uh, so next up we have the tax reform. Uh, it was the biggest overhaul of the nation's tax code in three decades. Uh, it slashed corporate tax rates from 35% to 21%. Uh, some critics argue it was a windfall for massive corporations uh, at the expense of the middle class. Uh, administration officials predicted GDP boost by 3 to 6%. Now, we haven't seen the GDP boost that they expected so far. However, I can say, at least in my experience, that slashing of the corporate tax was enough of an incentive for my company to give more back to its employees. Mm. I think my company is an exception to that rule. I think a lot of companies take that as a windfall and they absorb the profit themselves. Right. Uh, this kind of goes back to the early 80s with Reagan economics of trickle-down economics where, you know, give the rich people more money and then it'll trickle down to other people. Which and I don't think that worked then, did it? That has never worked in the history of mankind, <laughs> yeah. actually. Turns out the rich just get richer. <laughs> you don't get rich by spending, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> so the tax reforms definitely are there. A lot of those went in place before the COVID pandemic happened. And I think a lot of the benefits that happen from that tax reform are largely wiped out because of the debt the company, the country has incurred uh, as a result of a lot of these COVID relief packages. Yeah, but that tax plan, that tax, that corporate tax rate is going to stay in place until the new administration could put something together to overturn it. So it's something to think about. That's correct. Yeah. So the benefits will still be there for a lot of that. Uh, let's talk about the the reform of the justice system a little bit. So. He One of the things that, that Trump tried to do was address the mass carcera incarceration in the federal prisons. Uh, for several decades, they've been severely overpopulated. A lot of it had to do with uh, lower-level 
drug arrests for minor infractions. But he also overhauled the federal sentencing to reduce the minimum mandatory sentences. And that's that's kind of a concept that a lot of people aren't familiar with is that the federal guidelines for sentencing for just about every crime out there, there's a minimum amount of time that you can sentence someone. And even if it's an insignificant issue, but you have to sentence someone, they have to get that minimum amount of time. Um, and that was largely done to try to preserve fairness in, in the penal system itself so that you couldn't have people buying judges off and stuff like that. So one of the things that Trump did do was he reduced those minimum sentences so that even though you may be going into jail for these offenses, you're getting out sooner. Um, he also tried to shift focus from uh, punishment to rehabilitation and more job training opportunities. One of the problems that convicted felons have when they get out of prison is they lack the skills to, to get jobs and, and employment. As a result, they become, become a burden on society. So the focus kind of shifted to try to prepare these individuals to get back into the workforce and become producing members of society again. And what's the last thing that we have to talk about for his accomplishments? Uh, defeating the ISIS caliphate. Trump has falsely claimed ISIS is totally defeated. Uh, though territory has been lost, there are still an estimated 18,000 fighters uh, between Iraq and Syria. The U.S. was successful in killing ISIS leader, um, probably going to pronounce his name wrong, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. I apologize if That's I actually pretty it good. I, I, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's no different than when George Bush landed on the aircraft carrier with the big giant banner and said, mission accomplished. Right. Progress has been made. More progress has been claimed than has been made, I think. At this point in time, ISIS is lacking territory, but they're not lacking support. Uh, they're getting support through other countries like Syria and Iraq and Iran. So they're being funded by these countries, but they might not have the territory that they once had. Yeah, I think conflicts like this in this in this area of the world are always going to be this messy, and they have been since the U.S. began to get involved way back in what, the 70s and 80s. It's always been a, a difficult, uh, not war, but difficult conflict to manage, whether through proxy or for, through direct involvement from the U.S., and I think that this is no different. I think, and it's going to continue to be this way because we just, it's, it's too difficult of something for us to manage and certainly not fix. Sure. Yeah. And no, I agree a hundred percent. One of the things that I didn't put in here that, it, that was related to this was the drawdown on troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, which Donald Trump has made significant progress there. He had wanted to get us out of that area completely. But because of the sensitive nature of that territory, we couldn't pull out entirely. Yeah. Um, but the number of people, number of uh, troops that are in that area have been reduced, ironically enough, to the point that we had more people in Washington, more soldiers in Washington for the inauguration than we had in Afghanistan oh, really? and Iraq. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's it's difficult because I've, I'm obviously not like a general or anything, but it seems like we make the progress with the troops, and then the second the troops are gone all that progress is lost sometimes overnight. So it's a difficult call. It's easy to say, we're going to get everybody out of here, but it's a sticky situation. It's not that easy. Yeah. And when you think about it, you figure this is the longest war the United States has ever been involved in. You know, the only, the closest one to this was Vietnam, mm -hmm. which was roughly 10, 12 years. But I figure we've been fighting this war in that territory, this war on terror since September 11th uh, attacks. Yeah, and we could we could probably do a whole show comparing that to Vietnam. I mean, they're somewhat similar in terms of uh, a difficult terrain, um, the language barriers, things like that, uh, guerrilla tactics, and all that. It's it's it is just a mess. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's some of the notable accomplishments that Trump had in office. Let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about some of the failures that I think a lot of people have focused on. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. 
explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Tomorrow. Today we are talking about. Uh, the legacy of Donald Trump. We just went over some of his notable accomplishments. I think it's prudent for us to t- talk about some of his failures at this point in time. So the first one that I have here is the incident in Charlottesville uh, related to George Floyd. So during this entire process, Trump really blamed, quote, many sides for the violence Uh, at the rally for George Floyd. And at the time, he claimed that there were, quote, very fine people on both sides, one side being the Black Lives Matter group who were protesting the death of George Floyd, the other side being made up largely of white supremacists and the KKK. This statement itself really stirred up a lot of a, a bit of a hornet's nest here when he was describing these white supremacists as very fine people. And he took criticism from both Democrats and Republicans, including traditionally staunch supporters like Lindsey Graham. What are your thoughts on, on this particular failure of Trump's? I think it, it's, it seems like such a simple thing, right? You see white supremacists and KKK leaders on one side, you just have to condemn them and he couldn't do it. And he was directly asked. I remember multiple times by reporters to just condemn them and he wouldn't do it. And it makes you wonder why that is and, and what is going through his mind and, and his other his uh, administration's mind, why they he simply would not come out and condemn them. And you saw that again recently with the ins, uh, insurrection at the Capitol, where he said, go home. We love you. Very kind words to people that were attempting to storm and succeeded in storming the Capitol building. And it's it's it just makes you wonder. <laughs> Yeah, well, and the thing is that when this happened, there was a a lot of research that came out about Trump's history and the Trump family history, and information came out at this time that his father was a member of the KKK. He was arrested uh, in the early part of the 20th century at a KKK rally for crimes that were committed at the time. So it, it was very disturbing to see this side of a president come out where he was openly endorsing white supremacists. And that was a pattern of repeated alarmist type behavior that we've saw the last at least two years of his presidency where where we've had these issues. What was the next thing that that we're pointing out here? Uh, So we're taking a look at America's global image under the Trump presidency. Uh, America's global image has declined significantly under Trump. I think that anybody that reviews the last four years can probably put that together. Uh, Trump repeatedly insulted key U.S. allies while cozying up to dictators. Um, Trump pulled the U.S. out of key international agreements like the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, Surveys show the majority of citizens from 32 different countries have an overall lack of confidence in Trump to do the right thing on world affairs. Uh, And finally, Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic has left the U.S. embarrassed on the world stage and created a void in global leadership that China is rushing to fill in currently. Yeah, I mean, he left us really in a bit of a predicament. Yeah. Uh, So much so that immediately after the election, before the results were certified, you had uh, allied nations that were reaching out to to Joe Biden to congratulate him on the win before it was even official. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the long-term implications of that are. Because I think a lot of the damage that he did, at least as far as our allies go, are things that can be built back fairly quickly with him out of office. Mm -hmm. My concerns center around more the relationships that he had with the 
adversaries of the United States, like the Pu- the Putins yeah. and North Korea and and so forth. You know, I mean, he really took the country in a direction that it never went in the past. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there's multiple instances of him talking about how he admires Vladimir Putin and things like that. And it's not a great look, right? I mean, on paper, Americans are supposed to be like this bastion of freedom, which obviously in practice is not necessarily the case. But when you're on the world stage cozying up with known dictators, borderline admitted dictators who have, of course, never been proven, but have, you know, eliminated political rivals through, you know, various means or uh, subjugating their own people. When you see the leader of the free world being friendly with them, it, it sends a, a disturbing message to other countries, not to mention the people of America as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of scary when we get to that point. So the next thing we talk about is immigration, which was one of the things that Donald Trump had campaigned on. Um, his promise to build the wall, to stop illegal immigration coming in, to deport the people that were in the country already that shouldn't have been here, in his opinion. You know, Trump has been accused of human rights abuses and violating international law by the UN for his treatment of undocumented immigrants. I couldn't tell you the last time an American president was accused of human rights violations. Uh, Trump policies had led to the separation of at least 5,500 families and saw children placed in cages for the world to see, which was another embarrassing moment that the press really hammered him on. 445 of those children still are left separated from their parents. So it's a continuing problem where they can't find these parents for the children. The president of the American Academy for Pediatrics labeled Trump's policies nothing less than government-sanctioned child abuse. Yikes. <laughs> What are your thoughts on his immigration policy? I mean, we've got a lot of the wall done, yeah. right? So is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I don't I don't think the wall was a great idea. I mean, it, it it for people that think that we should take a strong stance on immigration, I think it's a a very good physical thing to see. But I think in practice, I don't know that the wall really works. And not to mention, we speaking back to the ICE situation, um, we were gonna we actually talked about doing a whole episode on ICE, um, but Doing the research, we found it it would be better to just lump it in with this. Um, but the fact that 545 children don't have their parents or any real person to take care of them still, it, and for this long, is is horrifying. And the fact that it's just it's still happening. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, Trump tried to defend his actions by claiming that a lot of these children were not brought over by their parents; they were being brought over by criminals and and mules and you know, people that were trying to get into the country illegally and using the children as a means to get into the country. And there just wasn't any facts to back that, that claim up. As with a lot of the things that we deal with, with Trump, there's a, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of what the Trump administration has labeled alternative facts. And I think you have, a difficulty in sifting through there's there there's so much misinformation thrown out about these things that it takes an effort to sift through that that you shouldn't have to make such an effort to do yeah i think that i mean we'll probably touch on it more later in our concluding thoughts but i think that's part of the plan is to put as much uh false things out there that you question what is real and what is true and then from there you can make your reality whatever you want right so what was the next thing that we're going to ding him on here? Uh, so the handling of Iran, Syria, and Afghanistan. We touched a little bit on this uh, with the troop withdrawals. Uh, Trump's decision to withdraw from the U.S. from the 2015 Iran nuclear deal induced chaos throughout the Middle East. Um, it remains one of Trump's most unpopular decisions in the global arena. Trump has failed to thwart Iran's aggressive behavior through his maximum pressure campaign. Uh, he exacerbated the situation by ordering the killing of Iran's top general, uh, another name I'm Gonna probably mispronounce uh, Kasim Soleimani, uh, which was huge when it happened. I remember we talked about it on one of the previous shows yeah. um, about how insane that was, and it, it's almost like we forgot it happened. But here it is again, looking back at everything. Uh, Iran has since abandoned the nuclear deal and is actively working towards nuclear weapons. Uh, again, Trump pulled U.S. troops out of Syria, uh, abandoning U.S. allied Kurdish forces. I remember that was extremely controversial too. Uh, too. 
especially with, I saw a lot of veterans on Twitter, like talking about that when that happened, about how that was wrong to do because you left these people hanging to dry. Uh, the withdrawal induced a humanitarian crisis in the region and the security vacuum that Russia, Iran, and accused war criminal Syrian President Bashir al-Assad benefited from. Uh, Trump started a massive pullout of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, essentially surrendering the country once again to the Taliban. And finally, Trump dismissed dismissed published reports that Russia paid bounties to Taliban-like militants to kill U.S. troops. So we're getting a little bit of the cozying up with dictators again in this in this section as well. And overall, it's it's not a great look. <laughs> yeah, no. And if you look, you know, at the gr- at the big picture <clears throat> of weakening our position in the Middle East by all these troop pullouts, by pulling out of the, the Iran nuclear deal, which is just going to incite additional chaos. It's going to rile the Israelis uh, who won't withstand, who won't stand for Iraq having nuclear weapons. So they're going to act unilaterally on their own. If we do not maintain a coalition in the area, you're, you're basically lighting the fuse on a powder keg and, I I look at what he did and I can't fathom why you would have done that. Uh, he claims that he doesn't want America tied up in these long-term wars, but we're almost like the control rod in the nuclear reactor there. And if you pull that control rod out, the nuclear reactor is going to melt down. Yeah, it's kind of like what we talked about before. Like it's It's easy to say, well, I don't want America involved in these situations. But when you've got nuclear deals signed with these countries – that's more than just a war. There's there's larger implications there on both the world stage and for that local area. And it's uh like you said it's it's lighting a fuse that I guess the new administration is going to have to deal with. Yeah, and and it's a it's a headache, you know. I mean, not only is it weakening the US position and our allies position in the region, you're you're directly strengthening our adversaries position in, at the same time. Uh, which makes you wonder what team Trump was really playing for at the time. So the next big one that that Trump has been trying to de- de- take care of since day one was the repeal and the replacement of Obamacare. Uh, Trump lost the vote for a full congressional appeal uh, thanks to, at the time, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg? No, Senator McCain. Oh. That was that was like one of the great acts of defiance that Senator McCain had against Donald Trump was to to turn that vote down. Um, he's managed to dismantle parts of it, including the rollbacks on tax penalties for those that are not enrolled in health care. But in the meantime, he's failed to offer anything close to a replacement. He's been questioned several times on this, and his statement has been, oh, it's well, it's it's ready. We're going to roll it out in a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks never got here. He never rolled out a replacement for it. The Supreme Court, as a result of that, did not allow it to be repealed because there wasn't a replacement for it. But he's weakened it significantly, and it, this is another problem that he's generated that the current administration, the new administration, is going to have to deal with. Yeah, I'm not sure if if the Biden team has said what their plans are to deal with this, but you'd imagine they're probably just going to reinforce it and kind of build back up where it was. You, you have to. You have to at least put in the stuff that was that was pulled out yeah. at this point because it's kind of silly to not have these in. And it's unfortunate for people that – because this was one of his big things when he was running for president was that he was going to get rid of Obamacare and, put, and Obamacare and put something new into place. It's unfortunate that all these people were – that voted for him or promised that and unfortunately simply never got it. Well, and the, the ultimate irony is, is that he didn't want to get rid of Obamacare. He wanted to get rid of Obama's legacy mm. and Obamacare being a large part of that legacy was one of the things that he targeted. Right. What's the next thing we have? Uh, so we have the uh, twice impeachment. Uh, this has been obviously in the news recently. Uh, Trump is the first U S president to be impeached twice while in office. Uh, Trump's first impeachment was for abuse of power when he attempted to solicit outside foreign interference in a U.S. election. Uh, I believe that was Ukraine, correct? Correct. Uh, Trump withheld $400 million in congressionally approved military aid from the Ukraine to pressure them into investigating Joe Biden's son for corruption. His second impeachment revolved around his attempt to incite an insurrection of his supporters when they stormed and breached 
the U.S. Capitol in an attempt to stop the certification of the 2020 election. Yeah, we're not talking about flimsy things here. No. <laughs> we're literally talking about two treasonous acts that the President of the United States, who's sworn to uphold the Constitution, has been accused of. Now, that the first impeachment that we had, <clears throat> he was not found guilty. He was not convicted of the impeachment. But that was largely because the Senate was controlled, the majority of the Senate was controlled by the Republicans at the time, who, for whatever reason, whether it was fear of repercussions or what, uh, would not go against Donald Trump despite the overwhelming evidence. You know, the, the large accusation in that first impeachment was that he solicited outside interference in American elections. If that wasn't enough, based on this phone call that, that came out, during the whole process of this when it came out, he later, on public television, you know, on news networks, stood in the driveway of the White House and further solicited China to interfere in the election by investigating Joe Biden's son. So uh, you could throw out that first allegation where he was trying to hold money over the Ukraine's head. He's publicly inviting a, an aggressor nation to interfere with our election. How he didn't get correct, uh, convicted of that is really just mind boggling. Yeah, it's uh, stuff like that we'll touch on most likely later, but it sets a dangerous precedent for future presidents of, of what it means to be president and what you can do and what you can get away with. And this is another example of that. Yeah, and, and he, you know, is unique in that he's the first to be impeached twice. Mm -hmm. Not sure that's something I'd want to put on my resume. It's something I've been thinking about a lot, especially with going back and looking at this legacy that will certainly come up. But like – my generation and generations around my generation is we're living through history for better or worse. And these are things that when, if I ever have kids and they go to school, the teachers are going to say, go home and ask your parents about when the Capitol was stormed and when the president was impeached twice, like things like that. And I don't know if I want to talk about that, you know, like it's, it's, it's interesting to think of these events, you know, you just see it on Twitter, you see it on the news and things like that, but it's, documented history that is going to be in a book someday. Yeah. Yeah. And and we were there for it. And that's, it's scary. It really is. We were also there for the COVID-19 pandemic. We're still, we're still there. there. For it. You know, Trump's handling of COVID-19 will likely go down as one of the biggest disasters in U S history. By the time he left office, over 400,000 Americans have died. Trump admittedly downplayed the virus in an interview. He later ignored it completely as he struggled with the election. I mean, from the November election until the day he walked out of office, Trump ignored everything to do with the pandemic um, and ignored a lot of his responsibilities as, as president because I really think he just had a breakdown at that point. More U U.S. citizens have died of covid than all U.S. soldiers killed in combat in every war since 1945. I saw that when I was looking over the notes. That is insane. Yeah. More, more are dead from COVID than from Vietnam. And Trump completely and repeatedly downplayed the virus. He contradicted top public health experts. He flouted recommendations from his science advisors. Uh, and his own White House Coronavirus Task Force. Uh, he refused to accept responsibility for the pandemic, blaming it even up until his farewell speech on the 20th on China, calling it the China virus. He still won't accept responsibility for it. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you might as it's like you just got to commit, right? <laughs> like, right. Because at that point, if you're going to admit that you had any fault, you, you, you admit to one thing, you got to admit to it all. But I think, you know, every – and this is a discussion that's happened a bunch of times by now. But every president has like one or two really big crises in their administration, right? Yeah. And this was definitely one of his and his handling of it was poor. Yeah. <laughs> At, regardless of how you fall on the political spectrum, you you it's hard to disagree with that, that his handling was terrible and lives were lost because of it. Well, and it's almost like had he done absolutely nothing – 
that would have been better than what he did because he contradicted medical professionals' advice. He made fun of and mocked people who were taking advice from medical professionals to wear masks and social distance. He deliberately exposed his Secret Service detail when he himself contracted COVID so that he could have a publicity stunt driving around the block for the press. Then he returns to the White House, still infected, and makes a show out of taking his mask off and working in the White House with everybody else and exposing everyone else. Yeah. It's, um, and I don't know if we have it here, but also pulling out of the World Health Organization was really bad in the middle During of a, a pandemic. pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. It just, and I think we talked about that on another show as well. We're repeating ourselves, but like just the headline makes itself, right? Trump pulls out of World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic. Like, why would you do that? Exactly. Exactly. Well, and he wasn't taking anyone's advice anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered if we stayed in there. So what's the next thing that, that we have? Because it sounds like we got a lot more bad than good here, but yeah, you this know, section is a little long in the it. tooth, but <laughs> I feel like we're we're I feel like we're doing our best here. Uh so the next section is about the US economy. Uh Trump took credit for a robust economy that he inherited uh when he took office and had shown nearly ten years of steady growth prior to his election. Uh, the U.S. now faces one of the worst economic crises, crises in history, linked to his disastrous response to COVID-19, which we just talked about. Over 22 million jobs were lost. Unemployment is at 7.9%, more than double the 3.4% of the pandemic. The national debt is at the highest level since World War II. Uh, and the economic growth of the U.S. will average just above 0% for the first Trump term. Trump made the... Uh Quite a measure of success by citing the growth of the stock market throughout his his presidency. And the funny thing is, is, if you look back over the last 10 years, if you look back over the last two administrations, the Bush and the uh, Obama administration, we had the recession that hit during President Bush's term. Then you had all the bailouts, you know, the controversy over corporations that were too big to fail and the government bailing them out and so forth. But then we went on a steady increase in the economy that grew at a pretty consistent pace year over year, despite what Trump did. Uh, you didn't see any spikes in growth under Trump that, that would mark something significant that he did. But what you did see was all the controversies that came out with Trump, the economy continued to grow. And it grew not because of Trump, but in spite of Trump. Because typically any other president who would have gotten tied up in some of the controversies that he did would have had a direct impact on the economy. And it was almost as though the economy and, and the world expected this sort of thing from Trump. So they sort of shook it off and it didn't affect the economy. But even then, what you had was the pandemic hit. Your unemployment soared, the country shut down for a period of time, and the country never fully recovered from that. Our unemployment today is more than twice what it was before the pandemic hit. So if there's a measure of success to look at here, it's what the recovery looked like after the, the crash. And after the last recession that we had, there was significant growth. We've yet to see that in this case here. So the economy, even though the Dow Jones and the stock market's up and that's all great, the economy itself, the jobs themselves that were promised, that Trump has touted over and over again, just haven't materialized. Yeah. And, and again, we go back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, we go back again to the incoming administration and how they're going to, you know, you still have all the negative impacts of the pandemic, which is still going on and, and how they're going to deal with that and how they can come back from that. It's, it's a, it's a complex thing that is not as easy as, oh, I was president for four years. Everything that happened in those four years is cut off from what was before me and what is after me. This is what I did. It doesn't work like that. Right. And especially when it comes to the economy, which is obviously one of those hot button issues that people love to talk about when they talk about who they're going to vote for or who is a successful president. Um, but it's not as black and white as, you know, some people would like to think it is. Absolutely. 
So the last thing that we wanted to uh, kick Donald Trump for here <laughs> is damaging democracy. So Trump consistently eroded democratic norms during his tenure. Trump's constant attack on the media led UN experts to warn of raised risk of violence against journalists. He's threatened to deploy U.S. troops to American cities and demanded poll workers stop counting ballots to sway the election in his favor. Trump's constant dissemination of disinformation on the electoral process have led historians to draw parallels between him and Benito Mussolini. Trump has refused to accept the clear-cut results of the election and failed to provide any substantial proof to his claims for election fraud. The president is charged now with inciting insurrection at a rally and attempting to prevent a peaceful transfer of power. So now, additional, even if we, since I wrote these notes up earlier in the week, additional information has come out that shows not only did Tr Donald Trump incite and encourage his supporters to storm the Capitol, he also has financial ties to several organizations that were part of that that shows he's financed those groups to do exactly that. I don't think democracy has ever been threatened like this since the Civil War. What do you think? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And and the difficult part is these are all facts, right, that we've just stated, but I can still guarantee you that there's somewhat half of the country that would disagree with this. And that's where the real damage is, the, the erosion of a common reality that we all have, right? Because, and I think that that is, and I, I mentioned it before, but I think that that's part of the tactic is to put so much information, false information out there and to do all these things that for any other president, any one of them would have got them out of office most likely or a terrible scandal, but to just keep doubling down and to keep, uh, you know, moving facts around, it has eroded just average people's way of thinking. And, it's it's I've seen it in my own life personally people I know that we can't even talk about it because we don't agree on the facts and what is real and what is not and just because I have facts it makes me you know I, I'm only saying that because I hate Trump but it's not that that's not what is true and I think that that is a thing that we're going to see in the coming years is this this uh you know difficulty of telling what is fact and fiction even if Trump is no longer in office I think that mark that stain is going to remain with the country for a while. Yeah, like, you know, you are you could have your own opinion. You're entitled to your own opinion, right. but you're not entitled to your own facts. The facts are the facts. And regardless of how much effort is put forth to disseminate misinformation, to skew those facts, the facts are still there. It's unfortunate that we have to go through the effort, almost like an archaeological dig, to get through all of the lies so we can get down to the facts themselves. And even then, the diehard supporters of someone like Trump still just simply refuse to accept the, the facts. Whether or not you choose to accept the truth doesn't make it any less true. And there are people out there that are having a very dif difficult time accepting that. Uh, one of the networks we stream on here, uh, we stream on uh, a network called Vaughn Live, and... There's a lot of Trump supporters that that watch that particular service. And there's been a couple of instances where people, you know, during our, our replays there have directly questioned, you know, what are we talking about? Trump won the election in a landslide. And it 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 makes me stop to wonder, despite all of the information that's out there, none of which points to a Trump victory. How could somebody possibly think that he won when not a shred of evidence has been produced despite there being dozens of court cases that have been shot down by the Supreme Court, mind you, which has a majority of conservative justices that he put on the court have shot down so many of these lawsuits that he's brought. How could people still think that he won just because that's what they want? Yeah. And I think, and it's something that I've noticed a lot too. There's a lack of accountability in that mindset where, especially when we had the insurrection at the Capitol, immediately people, the conspiracies from that side of the, of politics 
uh, we're trying to blame it on Antifa and things like that. Where in reality, that's not the case. I don't think there was any evidence for that. It's just, it's a lack of accountability where it can't be me. It can't be my fault. And I think that's what you see a lot. And especially now, Trump has made himself out to be a martyr, with especially with the election results. And I think that that just feeds more into the cycle of a lack of accountability and, you know, Trump can do no wrong. And, you know, it was robbed, it was stolen from him, which none of that is true. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. Well, let's take another quick break. We'll come back and we'll, we'll have a kind of an open discussion about the lasting effects of Trump and what the future under Joe Biden is going to look like. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back. We are talking about the legacy of Donald Trump. And and now we're going to talk about what the lasting effects of Donald Trump are on the world in general. And I'm going to throw a couple of these categories at you and I want to get your thoughts. So the first thing that I have here I'd like to hear about is what is the future of the judiciary and the Supreme Court thanks to Donald Trump? Well, like we've talked about, he had the three Supreme Court judges and what was it, 150? 250. Uh, other judges appointed. So that's definitely a lasting impact. Um, I think it's really going to come down to, which is what I said in, during that segment, was how these judges are going to come down on a lot of decisions. I mean, we saw um, they don't always just toe the party line like you'd expect with certain things that Trump was trying to get them to do. Um, we just talked about it. What, I forget what it was where they... they uh, well, for the election. Yeah, results. yeah. Yeah. So something like that, you know, if the fear is that they would just follow his orders, that was proven to be false. So I think that that is that shows a somewhat of a hopeful thing where they are impartial, which is what you want from your judges. So hopefully we'll see that continue, uh, continued impartiality. The one thing that does concern me, though, is you have a man who appointed several hundred judges to lifetime appointments that will affect the judiciary moving forward. And this is the same man who was such a terrible judge of character appointing cabinet members that he had a revolving door on his cabinet and couldn't keep cabinet members. And he had positions where he had three and four replacements over the course of four years, which makes me wonder how competent and qualified is he to choose a justice that's there for life? Is that something that concerns you at all? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. And, and hopefully, um, yeah, he has not been great at picking people, but based off their character. Uh, but hopefully out of those 250, we'll get like, you know, a third that are good at their jobs, like, you know, best, you know, for the hope. Um, but if not, then hopefully the system will do its job and, you know, the, they'll resign or we'll find replacements, hopefully. That's that's being very optimistic. Okay. <laughs> well, we're always so doom and gloom, you know, I <laughs> try to think positively. How about foreign affairs and our allies? What do you think the lasting effects are going to be on that? Well, I think initially it's it's probably going to be negative, but luckily we have the benefit of Joe Biden already having a working relationship with a lot of these people, most likely, because of his time as vice president. Um, so I think that that is going to help rebuild a lot of the ties that Trump might have severed or damaged or tried to sever. Um, and I think, yeah, having Joe Biden as the president might uh, – the rest of the world will see America sort of back on track, hopefully, as having a functional government, a more, not traditional, but a more um, professional government. And I think that that'll, that'll hopefully uh, be a good thing for, uh, you know, our allies. And I agree with you 100% on those points. About the economy and taxes, what do you think we can see 
long term for that. Now, well, we talked about that that corporate tax slash. Um, hopefully, that is at least adjusted. I think that that's way too much of a slash for corporations. Um, I know you had mentioned that your company, things like that, get benefits, but I think long, like big picture, I do think it negatively impacts the most amount of people. Um, for the economy, I think it's probably going to get worse before it gets better until we get coronavirus under control, which hopefully with the new administration we will now that they're encouraging science and uh, vaccinations are rolling out and things like that. Hopefully, once the virus is stabilized, the economy will also in turn be. I think you're kind of you're on the mark there. It's really everything still centers around Corona. Yeah. What about immigration? Can we expect long term effects of his immigration policies? Um, I think that also kind of ties in with uh, foreign allies and, and the world's perception of America. Uh, hopefully, Biden will be able to be a little bit more welcoming and to immigration. Now, I, I know people are some people are very against any kind of immigration, um, but I think that taking the stance that Donald Trump did of almost xenophobia or not almost xenophobia uh, is not the way to go about it. And I think even if Biden's going to come down strictly on it, I'm not sure he's going to be as uh, vocal about it. Sure. Yeah. And what about, you know, I specifically mentioned COVID here, but pandemics in general, do you think the next pandemic, hopefully that won't be for at least another hundred years, do you think the country is going to respond differently than it did during Donald Trump's reign? I'd say most likely, um, especially because, you know, looking a hundred years back with the Spanish flu, People have such a, uh, you know, it's when you look in a history book and you see all the pictures in black and white. It's it's not as tangible. But with this, in our modern age, <laughs> where you have, you know, social media and things that will most likely be able to be looked back on, I think it'll be a lot more real for people. And hopefully if it's less than 100 years, people like my age or younger um, will be alive still. And will say that, you know, this is not a joke. And hopefully whatever administration is in power at that time will have learned from past mistakes and, you know, be able to have some sort of um, pandemic like task force, you know, that's is designed for these things, especially as the world gets more and more globalized every day. Yeah. Here's the hope. And, and finally, what do you think the long-term impact on the presidency itself is going to be? I mean, we just had a president who challenged every norm and every check that's been put in place on the power of the presidency. Do you think there's going to be a lasting effect on the presidency? Absolutely. And I think that Trump testing all of those limits is going to set a, like I said before, a dangerous precedent going forward. And I think that even the, you know, the Biden administration will probably take some liberties with that as well, with what a president can do with things like executive orders or uh, pardons and things like that. Um, hopefully that, that extended power, will get reeled back, you know, checks and balances and all over time. But I think in the immediate future, it's, it's still going to be a little up in the air on, on how that, how the presidency is viewed. Okay. So the future. All right. Let's, let's turn our attention to the future under Joe Biden. He's got four years. I don't think he's going to be up for, I don't think he's going to do for a second term. So he's got four years to accomplish what he wants. And the first thing really is to unify a nation that is more divided now than any other time in our history, save for the Civil War. Do you think Joe Biden has what it takes to unify the country, given the staunch support of 70 million people who voted for Donald Trump? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> um, because it's it's just, you know, in his speech during the inauguration, he talked about it not being about parties, which I feel like every president says, but that doesn't work. It's not how that works. And I, like... In my experience, I don't think that that's possible. I just think that, and I don't know what it is, but I think people are much too focused on their political parties and and that, that divides us so much. And I'm not really sure how you can fix that. I think the best way to go about fixing it would be uh, in the government, seeing you know handshakes from both parties, agreeing on things. But if that's not going to change, then I don't see how that's going to change for the public either. I agree. Uh, handling of COVID. So there's been a number of things in the first couple of days of the Biden administration that he signed by executive order to address COVID. Do you feel more confident in Biden's ability to handle COVID than Trump's? Do you think we're going to get ahead of this? Do you, you know, where do you think we're going with this and are we going in the right direction? 
Um, overall, I am more confident in Joe Biden. Um, my only fear is that so much damage has already been done um, by the Trump administration and, and how Biden is going to be able to, like, if he wants to be effective, if he'd be able to be as effective as he can, given the the things that Trump has done. Um, hopefully, using those executive orders, like you said, um, he'll be able to reverse a lot of that and speed the process up and get vaccinations out um, and get the resources to people that need it. Um, again, a lot of hoping. Um, we'll see what actually happens. So foreign policy. So you you had mentioned already that, that Joe Biden has an established working relationship with a lot of our allies. Um, over the four years that he was in office, Trump did a lot of damage to those through insults, through, you know, pulling out of treaties and, and military movements and various things. Do you think Joe Biden has it within him to rebuild those alliances in the short time that he's probably going to be in office? I think, yes, I do. And I, I think part of that comes be from, and it's one of the criticisms people might have of Joe Biden of being a career politician. But I think that when it comes to foreign policy and foreign affairs, being a career politician can be a good thing because, you know, you saw Trump, who's not an, as experienced of a political leader, how that worked out dealing with other um, world leaders. So I think having someone that was already vice president and has met all these people, but has also been in the quote unquote business for his entire life, I think that you pick up some skills along the way that make you a better diplomat. And hopefully that those skills are put to use. Very good point. So some of those executive orders that Joe Biden has signed in to law at this point dealt with undoing some of the things that Donald Trump did. Do you think that Biden should be focused on erasing the Trump legacy or do you think his efforts would be better focused elsewhere? Well, I think it's a it's kind of a double edged sword because erasing the Trump legacy will also benefit a lot of the American people, especially when it comes to things like the COVID-19 pandemic, because part of Trump's legacy was hindering the process of getting people vaccinated and the resources, like I said, that they need. Um, so I think in in those instances where erasing Trump's legacy would benefit the American people. I think that that is a good thing, but just turning it into a, you know, a contest of, you know, if I can erase this guy's name from the books of history, I don't think that's worth your time. So the last one that I wanted to talk about here is the chance of success. You know, you mentioned that Joe Biden is a career politician. He's been in the white house, you know, administration before as vice president, he's spent, you know, an eternity in, in the Senate and, and the legislative branch. Uh, so he comes to us with a wealth of experience, but he's also the oldest president to take office at this point in time at 78 years old. Do you think his age is going to contribute to his ability to be successful? And do you think he, he'll have the support that he needs? Cause right now there's a small majority, but there is a majority of Democrats in the Senate and there's a majority of Democrats in the House. So the Democrats really hold the power right now, at least for the next two years. Will that help his success? Do you think he can be successful in his platform and what he wants to do for the next four years? Um, I've said it before, but I certainly hope so. Um, I do think his age is definitely going to be one of the main points of contention for people that criticize him. Um, I hope that in terms of his mental facilities, he seems like he's all there. And his speeches and things like that, he speaks very eloquently, except for a few stutters occasionally, which, you know, people will harp on. But I think in terms of leading, I think he'll he'll do what he needs to do. And I think the people behind him will also be extremely helpful. Um, and, you know, the presidency is obviously a huge burden for someone to undertake. We've seen the before and after photos of, you know, when people come into office versus when they leave. Um, I think despite his age, I think he'll be able to you know, fulfill his duties uh, to the best of his ability. And I would tend to agree with you largely because I think he's smart enough to turn his cabinet into an asset rather than a distraction. Mm -hmm. Much of the Trump presidency centered around controversy of cabinet members, cabinet turnover. Uh, he didn't trust his cabinet members. He didn't trust the people around him. Uh, he was, more inclined to make unilateral decisions on his own rather than to trust the experts around him. And I think Joe Biden is smart enough, experienced enough and wise enough to not fall into those same pitfalls. So I think the team that Joe Biden puts around him 
is really going to be what contributes to his success more than anything. So we'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll get any final thoughts that you have and finish up with the podcast business. Go for your final thoughts. Uh, So I think looking back at the Trump legacy, one of the biggest appeals he had when he went into office was people didn't want another career politician. They wanted something different. And they got that. And it overall, I don't think was a good thing. (laughs) Uh, We look, we've broken it down into various different topics, but I think overall it had a negative impact on the country, right? And you ask yourself, that's a, I forget what president did this, but are you better off four years? uh, Hang on, I'm messing this up. (laughs) Are you better off now than you were four years ago? And I think most people would say no, uh, whether it's for economic reasons or the impact the coronavirus had on them. And obviously you can't blame all these things just on Trump. However, he was the president and he's supposed to be the leader. And I think it's hard to disagree that he failed as a leader. And uh, hopefully, you know, there's obviously detriments to having a career politician in power. But I think now that is what the country most likely needs. Yeah, I think this was a case of we got what we asked for and what we asked for was not what we needed. It was a learning experience, I think. The country will continue to feel the effects of for years to come. But I think it's it's a learning experience that we won't make that same mistake again. Um, that was all we had for today. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming to talk uh, about this uh, volatile subject. Before we go, I do want to throw the plugs out there. You can get the audio version uh, of this podcast listed as Insights into Tomorrow. Video versions of all of our podcasts can be found if you look for Insights into Things. We are listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, Pandora, and something else that I can't remember. <laughs> I, I really need to write all these down. Tune you know, in. Tune in. Sure. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, we'll tune in. That. Sorry about that. Uh, we would also invite you to reach out to us and give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, you can find us at insights into things where you can get links to all that and everything else on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Anything else? That is it. All right. Another one in the books. Bye.